We continue our series that we started last week, and then we actually wrap it up this week. It's a mini-series for a sermon. Uh, as we look at our relationship with God, and as we reflect on last week, we were reminded of that commitment that God makes to us. As He saves us by His grace, as He brings us into this faith, into Jesus, and how the Bible continues to reveal this to us as we continue to give God glory and sing His praises. And this commitment that God makes to us is not based on us. It's based on God's incredible, unconditional, no-strings-attached love for each one of us. And it's because of that commitment, because of that new covenant that God makes with us, that we are God's saints. And we celebrate that we are saints now and forever. Now forever is an interesting concept. Forever can be hard for us to comprehend. I remember in my first call as a pastor, I was serving a congregation in Leavenworth, Kansas. And one of our homebound members uh, was 99. Uh, she was still living by herself. Uh, she had never married, didn't have any kids. Uh, she was blind and had driven up until the time she was 97. Uh, I don't know how that worked with being blind. <laughs> but in one of our visits, she said to me, I don't understand forever. Everything has an end. How can this forever be something that doesn't end? And it was at that moment as a very young pastor, that I went, okay, if a 99-year-old person doesn't understand forever, there's a lot of grace for me. <laughs> and there's a lot of stuff that I don't have to understand. But we accept it by faith. You know, there's the infinity loop that symbolizes what forever is. It doesn't have a beginning, it doesn't have an end. And yet, as we live in this world, we have beginnings and we have ends. We begin our service at 10 o'clock. And because of time change, I can preach an extra hour today. So we can get out later or not. Um, but we're used to running on a time schedule. And yet God doesn't do that. And there's other things that God does that don't necessarily make sense for us either. And that is making us saints. Now, some people have said, well, you know, Protestants, you all don't have saints. But you look around many communities and you'll find, you know, St. John Lutheran Church, St. Mark United Methodist Church, John Knox Presbyterian, stuff like this. Churches that have been named after others who have walked before in the faith. Now, as Lutherans, uh, we have a little different understanding of sainthood than our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters. Uh, we don't believe that there is a criteria that we have to meet to be saints. We don't have to do miracles. We don't have to um, live up to a certain standard. Our sainthood is not based on anything that's in us. There's no way that we can try hard enough to earn this gift that God gives us to be his saints. It's a gift that comes to us by God's grace. As God claims and cleanses us in the waters of baptism. As he gives us that robe of righteousness. That white robe that has been washed clean in the blood of the Lamb. As we heard from Revelation earlier today. And we get that robe. Completely unworthy and undeserved. And it's because of Jesus that God makes us worthy. And he gives us this gift. And makes us his saints. So right now, I want you to turn to somebody around you and say, good morning, saint, and use their first name.
because of what Jesus has done for us. And yet, as we walk through this world, we live in a world that has a lot of conflict and a lot of struggle. Uh, and some of that is causing people to say, is, is it time? Is the end near? I say, come Lord Jesus, every time an election cycle comes up. So, um, but, you know, is it time? We don't know. But we have wars and rumors of wars, you know. Are we on the brink of World War III? We have the war going on in Israel. We have the war that continues to go on in the Ukraine. We have a lot of gun violence in our streets with drive-by shootings here in buildings. We have conflict in our families. We have conflict in our relationships. We have earthquakes. We have all sorts of environmental issues. And we wonder, is the end near? And I would say it's nearer than it was yesterday. But is it here? Only God knows. And yet, God's people have been waiting for that time when we can see Jesus face to face and experience the ultimate in a relationship with this God who is committed to us forever. And Revelation paints a bit of a picture of the, the world that we are living. And Revelation... It's a tricky book. It's not my favorite book. It speaks very metaphorically all throughout. Um, and I think that people who take it literally and try to put their, uh, to unravel the secrets of Revelation, I don't think they end up in the places that God wants us to end up. I uh, served with a pastor years ago who taught a two-year study on the book of Revelation. And his, the title for his study was <clears throat> God Wins. And for me, it's that simple. But with Revelation, we do get this, some glimpses as the Apostle John is taken to heaven and has this vision. And in Revelation 5, he is given a, uh, a scroll that has seven seals on it. And he cannot unseal it. And then the Lamb unseals those seals. And as the seals are opened, those seals represent conquest, represent suffering, represent economic injustice, represent death and martyrdom and environmental upheaval. And we can look back and see, okay, we can plot some of that out on a timeline with the Roman Empire. And so there was, in some ways, those seals were fulfilled in those next centuries, as the, the Roman Empire persecuted Christians greatly for 300 years. And we can continue to go back to those seals and say, you know what? As the world spins, we continue cycling through that same stuff. There is conquest. There is suffering. There is economic injustice. There is death. There is martyrdom. And the environment continues to get bouncy and bounce around. And at times as we live in this, it's hard to be hopeful. It gets very heavy. And the 24-hour news cycle doesn't help take away that heaviness. Because we have all this stuff converging on us right now. All this stuff converging on us and we're just feeling crunched. And we're feeling stressed. And we're wondering, is there any hope? <clears throat> Jesus knew this was coming. As he spoke in Matthew 5, he said these words. He said, happy are you when people insult you and harass you and speak all kinds of bad and false things about you because of me. Be full of joy and be glad. Because you have a great reward in heaven. In the same way, people harass the prophets who came before you. The reality is, this world has not been right since the beginning. I mean, you have Cain and Abel, two brothers, and one kills the other out of jealousy. And if you read Genesis, you find <coughs> stories of the most dysfunctional families that have existed within humanity. And yet God continues to point us towards hope. And in Revelation, there is a bit of a, a break that we get with the text that we're looking at in chapter 7 today. 
We have that seal. We have the seals broken. We have all this bad, nasty stuff happening. And then we get to chapter 7. And we go, we can take a breath. Because there's a different picture that's there. A picture of victory. As John unpacks his vision and, and lays it out to us, he's, God gives him a vision that makes sense for his world. And so there is a king, God himself, sitting on a literal throne. There are people gathered around the, the throne and they're dressed in white robes. And white robes were the Wrangler jeans of the first century. It's what everybody wore. But these robes are white because they had been washed clean in the blood of the lamb. We go, wait a minute. If I put blood in my clothes washer, that's not going to make things white, right? And so all, already we had in the metaphor. But there is this beautiful picture of a victorious king, our God, sitting on his throne with people shouting and waving their palm branches. And palm branches were the rally towels of the first century. They were things that marked the victory. And they were shouting out with their loud voices and shouting about this victory as they said, victory belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And there's a countless multitude there. Before our text in Revelation, it lists off the 12 tribes of Israel. And that number 12 is a number of completeness for God's people. It's the complete accounting for God's people. And then God multiplies it by a thousand to say, we just need a big number here. A big number of the complete completeness of all of God's people. And that's who are gathered in this space around the throne. Along with the angels, along with the four living creatures who all have some metaphorical understanding as well. And the angels and the four living creatures are also crying out as they say, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. An amazing celebration is taking place. And then there's this interesting questioning. One of the elders comes to John and says, who are these people wearing white robes and where did they come from? And John says, I said to him, sir, you know. Then the elder said to John, these people have come out of great hardship. They washed their robes and made them white in the Lamb's blood. This is the reason they are before God's throne. They worship him day and night in his temple and the one seated on the throne will shelter them. They won't hunger or thirst anymore. No sun or scorching heat will beat down on them. Because the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them. He will lead them to springs of life-giving water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. What an amazing picture of what is yet to come. As John unpacks this metaphorical celebration... A celebration with all of God's people from all time and space. A truly multinational, multicultural gathering of people from every nation, tribe, and language. And they're celebrating. And they're worshiping. And some of you went, wait a minute. 60 minutes is too long for a worship service for me. This is going to last forever? I'm not sure I want to go there. That word worship also means serve. And as we look at the beginning, we see Adam serving God in the garden. And as God restores everything to its newness and gives us that hope, we too will get to serve God in his kingdom. And who knows what that service is going to look like. There will be times of worship, but there might be times of gardening. For those of you who like doing that, as I've said, I love grocery stores. That's where I do my farming. Um, <laughs> but who knows how we'll get to serve. But we'll get to serve in God's presence forever. And so what do we do until that forever gets here? Well, we're already living in that forever. The reality is that we have that forever experience working for us right now. Because God has made that new covenant. 
And he has promised that he will be with us and he will hear us. Uh, there's a scene in the uh, Man of Steel movie about Superman uh, where Superman uh, flies out and he flies back away from the globe and then he hears all these voices. He hears crying, he hears cries for help, he hears people suffering and struggling, he hears conflict. And when he comes back, he speaks with Lois Lane and he says, I hear everything. And God hears everything. He hears our joyful celebrations. He hears our struggles. He hears our heartaches. He hears those times when we cry out because they just don't make sense. And that's part of that forever commitment that God makes to us. That he always hears us. He's always listening. And he is always with us. As Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he says, I listened to you at the right time and I helped you on the day of salvation. Look, now is the right time. Look, now is the day of salvation. The forever experience that we have with our God began at the point of our baptism. When God claimed and cleansed us, when God brought us to faith. And that continues on because now is the time. As John writes in 1 John 3, he says, Now we are God's children. And it hasn't yet appeared what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we'll see him as he is. But we don't have to wait to become God's children. We don't have to wait to become saints. Now is the time. We are God's children now. We were God's children yesterday. We were God's children back as, as far as we want to go in our faith walk. And we'll be God's children and God's saints forever. Our psalm provides some, some interesting words for us, especially as we live in this time in history. In Psalm 34, the psalmist says, I praise the Lord. Let the suffering listen and rejoice. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. The Lord saves his servants' lives. All those who take refuge in him won't be held responsible for anything. God forgives our sins and forgets all those things that we do that break his heart. And God promises to be with us in the best of times and in the worst of times. In the worst of times, it's easy for us to lose hope. In those times of struggle and heartache where we don't see things lining up the way that they should, we aren't experiencing that victorious picture, it's good for us to go back to Revelation and see that that is the best is yet to come. It's also good to go to the Psalms and to be reminded that life isn't always going to be a bowl of cherries. Sometimes we are in the pits. <clears throat> Life is not always going to be amazing. It's not always going to be perfect. And yet even in the worst of times, our God hears us and he is with us. A worship song that's been rolling through my head this last week, ironically, is called Forever. Um, I think that had something to do with the sermon title today. <laughs> Uh, but the chorus of that song goes like this. Uh, forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us. Forever. We have a God who is faithful, who is strong, and who is committed to always being with us. And that gives us hope, that gives us strength, and that continues to get us through each and every day. Amen. Again, encourage you to uh, ponder these questions. How did you see God at work in your life this week? What insight did you receive today? And how can you live that insight this week, especially for the good of?